certainly want to thank our sisters for leading us in that inspiring period of praise. It is now time to hear the word of God from the man of God. Today, our speaker is Dr. Sylvester Bowie, Jim Bowie, as some of us will know him as. Uh, Sister Anne-Marie will come to introduce our speaker. He's no stranger to us. So this time I'm going to invite Sister Anne-Marie to come to introduce us. Good morning, church. Good morning. Our speaker is a teacher by profession and he hails from the Garden Parish of St. Anne, where he worked with the Government Child Care Division at the Windsor Girls Home, St. Anne's Bay, and Augustine Place of Safety in Chapleton. He then migrated to the U.S., where he worked as a social worker in the Child Protective Services, working in the area of emergency response, family reunification, and adoptions. He then went on to work as professor at California State University, Sacramento, California, in the Division of Social Work during the period 2002 to 2020. So if you're doing the maths, you'll hear that he has kind of gone to sail on the high seas. Not quite. There he was engaged in both graduate and undergraduate practice, social welfare policy, and child welfare services, advising students acting as mentor and providing leadership in various capacities within the division, college, university, and the wider community. Currently, is Professor Ritos, who retired in August 2020. And that means he will remain a professor for as long as he wants to. And he's also engaged in part-time teaching in social welfare policy and child welfare services where we taught this course for in excess of 16 years. Our speakers made presentations at conferences and provided training and workshops throughout the United States, the Caribbean, in the islands of Trinidad, Barbados, Guyana, Bahamas, Martinique, Curacao, and the University of the West Indies, Mono, as well as Ghana and Nigeria. Now there's a whole lot more to our speaker you will hear the rest when you join us for the at the end of the month. He's a certified mediator. He has taught Sunday school over 30 years and is known to deliver sermons at the Ocho Rios congregation once he's in the island, where he's a very frequent visitor and was recently here as, as was last year as recently as July 2020. His hobbies are traveling, reading, cooking, as well as trying different types of food. He enjoys a good Bible study and vigorous debates, as those who know him very well here can attest. He has been married to Dan for 33 years, and he has been a Christian for over 43 years. Brethren, our speaker is no stranger to us, but we realized recently that it's the first time he would be addressing us here at Constant Spring, hence the need for a formal introduction. He prefers to be referred to simply as Jim. Please join us in welcoming Brother Jim, who will share the word with us today. We need to hear. Thank you. Let me thank you for this opportunity to share God's word. Um, it is with gratitude that I accept this invitation. And I pray God that by the end of our time together that we'll all be able to say it was good to have been in the house of the lord well, let me go ahead and start with prayer and then I'm, oh god oh heavenly father we thank you once again for this blessed opportunity to hear your words we thank you god for your people gathered to feast at your table how i pray oh god that i will be diminished as you expand i pray oh god that your word will touch hearts and just give me the right things to say, oh God, and eliminate any desire, oh God, to, to promote self and extend every opportunity, oh God, to worship and to glorify your holy and matchless name. We thank you once again for this opportunity and we just praise your name. Certainly um, recognize, let me go ahead and recognize um, my first boss when I got out to teach at college. Um, is, uh, on the Zoom this morning, um, Brother Emerson and his beautiful wife was who 
also worked at Windsor Girls Home at the time. Um, I thank you for um, giving me that opportunity because it did open a lot of doors. It is with gratitude to you and to um, friends that I've had for this period that I'm able to rejoice and even be willing to share God's word. It is a statement that Jesus takes care of us. And so what I want to do is maybe focus our attention, the, the, the idea that Jesus leads us, that he gives us abundant life, and that he has laid down his life for us. Uh, he leads us, gives us abundant life, and he laid down his life for us. So I'm going to spend a little time going through John chapter 10 to highlight the, the, the great God that we have, the great shepherd that we have in Jesus our Lord. What I'll maybe ask you to do, and I, I usually like to do this if I get so bored, bored that people fall asleep, um, is to, to start with the conclusion of the lesson and if you happen to fall asleep and woke up at the end you could still um, show them part of what the message was about because like a good shepherd jesus knows he sustains and he protects them. he even sacrificed himself for them and so Jesus did remind his disciples, if you love me, then you should feed my sheep. The lesson title just takes care of us. And actually, you could retitle it. You could retitle it as Jesus the Good Shepherd. You could retitle it the Great Sacrifice. Because the story that I'm telling this morning is about the Great Shepherd. The good shepherd that we have in all our experience, Jesus Christ. So, what I want us to do is to be thinking about some ways that Jesus takes care of us and takes care of you specifically. You know, be thinking what are some ways that Jesus takes care of us and takes care of you specifically. So, we're going to start out with John chapter 10, verse 5 verses. The, the whole passage must be seen with this in mind. And it should be understood in the context of the Old Testament and the Near Eastern region, where the concept of the shepherd symbolizes a royal caretaker of God. That's who the shepherd is, a royal caretaker of God's people. The, the, the scripture described God himself as a good shepherd of Israel. And in Psalm 8, verse 1, we find these words. Hear us, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned in the cherubim, kind of foot. There's also this great popular shepherd psalm, I should say shepherd scripture, which is Psalm 23, where verse 1 says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Then we have Isaiah in chapter 40 and verse 11, where the, the scripture says, see the sovereign Lord comes with power and his arms rule for him. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. Yes, Jesus, the chief shepherd, always take care of us. Jesus, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd, always take care of us. There is a great hymn, and I know that we, we sing this hymn in the Church of the Christ. Like the shepherd is just. And the song says, Lead it me, O blessed thought, O word with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that lead it me. And the refrain says, Lead it me, lead it me, by his 
own hand he leadeth me. Faithful follow I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. I want to go ahead and jump to verse 11 of the scripture before I start in verse two. Because verse 11 says that he tends his flock like a shepherd, gathers his in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently lead those that have young. Let me postulate here that being a shepherd is important in God's sight. You know, God denounced the false shepherd as we find in Isaiah chapter 15, verses 9 to 9. And in Ezekiel 34, and then he promises to provide the two shepherds, the Messiah, and here for the sheep in Ezekiel chapter 34 and verse 23. So that is the context within which we look at the fact that Jesus is our great shepherd, will always lead us, and yes, takes care of us. So I'm going to start at verses. One and two on the text. And as the verse points out, I tell you the truth. A man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way, he is a thief and a robber. And verse two says, the man who enters the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The one who climbs over, a thief and a robber, the one who enters the gate, he is the shepherd of the sheep. The thief and the robber comes in other ways other than the door, while the true shepherd will always enter through the door. You know why he does that? He has nothing to hide. So over in Joel chapter 2 and verse 9, they storm the city, they run along the wall, they climb into houses, entering through windows like thieves. And then John 10 and 7 says, so he said to them again, truly, truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. And then he reminds us in verse 8, all who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. And then he emphasizes in verse 9, I am the gate. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. I am the gate. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. But the sheep did not listen to them. Then he emphasized again, in, to emphasize it in Psalm 23 and verse 2, preparing green pastures for us, lying, and to be at peace because our cup runneth over. The thief and the robber comes in some other way, other than the door, while the true shepherd will always enter through the door because he has nothing to hide. Jesus, our great shepherd, he takes care of us. You know, I wish somebody would say amen. And by the highest praise and saying hallelujah, because after all, God had been good to us in sending Jesus, the great shepherd, to die in our stead. And for that, we should be grateful and give him praise. So verse 3 talks about the watchman um, in your own quiet time as you study. Because as I was preparing this, this text, something jumped out at me that maybe I had noticed before. You know, the watchman is apparently in charge of a large fold where several flocks were kept. There were many flocks and the shepherd responsible for each flock. So the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listens for his voice. He calls his own sheep and they respond because they're listening and they hear that voice. The shepherd did not call the sheep randomly, but only those who belong to him. And, you know, I thought of this idea, dark night, maybe a church event, you know, church is over and the lights are turned off and 
children start to cry. But this mother listens, hears her little one crying. And so she, she's not calling out for the rest of children that are crying, but she's calling out for her little Johnny. Johnny, Johnny. And Johnny hears his mom's voice and he comes over to be comforted. That is how it is when the shepherd who is not calling sheep randomly, but calling those who belong to him. You know, when I became a Christian, I was the one called, not my brother, not my sister, not my friend, you know, my good friend Stedman. Um, my call was for Jim. And by the way, Stedman had his own call. And so he responded to his call. And Pastor Bryant in 1978, when he was called, he had no idea that he was being called to start preparing for constant spring in 2020 during a coronavirus pandemic. Jesus knows his sheep. He calls them by name. He knows their temperament. He calls them by position. He called Brother Delroy to seize the moment in 2020 and be the kind of shepherd to God's flock that you would have him to be. I should hasten to add that Jesus will not get confused or mixed up. He knows each of his sheep by name, by purpose, and how he positions them. And he always does that according to his goodwill. Jesus knowing us as he does, calls us as he wills, and yes, he will always take care of us. Let me move on to verse four and five. In verse four, he goes ahead. And you know, this, was, this is the part that really um, caught my attention big time. It really did. The, the Palestinian shepherd led his flock. He does not drive them. He goes ahead of them and the sheep follow because they know his voice. And the question came to me, do you ever wonder why so many of us go astray, you know, like cut off from the flock? If we studied the scripture, we would avoid the many pitfalls. Look at verse five carefully. It says, but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. If we were sheep and not wolves, we would not follow old Satan into sin and trouble. And as the scripture entreats us, we should flee the very appearance of evil, as it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21 and 22. The scripture says, test everything, hold on to the good, and avoid every kind of evil. You know, let us stick with Jesus, because he is the great shepherd, and he will always take care of us. Jesus will always take care of us. So what are some of the things that Jesus wants to do for us? I'm going to go back to the great shepherd scripture, you know, Psalm 23. The, the psalmist said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me to lie in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. You know, Jesus wants to do so much for us that it is shocking that we do not avail ourselves to feast 
at his table. Think about the language of the psalm. I shall not want. This language is partly of experience in the presence, partly of confidence for the future. So of Israel looking back on the wandering in the wilderness, the scripture says, thou has lacked nothing. That's what it says in Deuteronomy chapter two and verse seven. Indeed, the Lord your God has blessed you in all works. He has watched over your journey through vast wilderness. The Lord your God has been with you these 40 years and you have lacked nothing. The psalmist is also looking forward to the land of promise. You shall not lack anything in it. Deuteronomy chapter eight and verse nine says, a land where you will eat food without scarcity, where you will lack nothing, a land whose rocks are iron and whose hills are ready to be mined for copper. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing present and future because Jesus will take care of us. Moving on down to verses seven through 10. The verse seven has a familiar declaration, you know, about I am. And I am here is Jesus. I am is the gate to his sheep, and all we must do is walk through the gate. In verse 8, it says, all before me false shepherds, like the Pharisees and the chief priests, they were not the real McCoy. Verse 9 says, the gate, the one way to salvation, inside the gate there's safety, and one can go out and find pasture, that is, to supply the supply of all our needs. You know, the, the, the scripture reminds us that Jesus will supply all our needs according to his riches in glory. And then verse 10 says, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus reminds us, and I quote here, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. In other words, as one version says, in abundance, the thief's interest is himself, and he looks to tear down and to destroy. Christ's interest is in his sheep, and it is to lift up and to liberate. Those whom Jesus enable will have life to the full, to the maximum, life more abundantly. The thief looks to steal, to fatten his pocket. Jesus come to protect the sheep so that the sheep might live. We need to remember that Jesus wants to give us not just life, but he wants to give us the abundant life. Jesus, being the great God that he is, will always take care of us. So verse 11, Jesus was ready to know to sacrifice for his sheep. And as we are reminded in John chapter six, verses 35 through 40, that there are many declarations of I am and what he will do for us. You know, I'd asked the question earlier on, what does Jesus want to do for us? Well, let me remind you. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whosoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Verse 38. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up as in the last day. And verse 40 says, for my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believe in him shall have eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus did lay down his life for the sheep. So this is where I really, again, got into the scripture and saw some things that I'd been kind of missing for a while. So I, I'm encouraging you in your own study time to get back to looking at this passage in John. You know, a Palestinian shepherd 
risk danger for his sheep, as we find in Genesis chapter 31 and 39, and then 1 Samuel chapter 17, 34 through 37. But he expects to come through alive. So the Palestinian shepherd will risk his life, but he expects to be alive at the end of the ordeal. Now, here's what we have with, with Jesus. Jesus said that the good shepherd will die for the sheep. The good shepherd will die for the sheep. If things get rough, the Palestinian shepherd might take off because he must stay alive for the rest of the flock. This is what I want you to digest now. Jesus would have still gone to the cross even if there was one sinner, you or me. Jesus would have still gone to the cross. He went to the cross for us as individual sinners. And he died so that we might have life and live. While the Palestinian shepherd worked to save his life, Jesus obediently went to death on the cross so that even his wandering sheep might have a chance at life, the abundant life. Now, isn't that the great shepherd, the wonderful shepherd? Isn't that the marvelous shepherd? Um, I asked a question earlier, earlier on, why do some go astray when we have such a wonderful savior, when we have such a blessed shepherd? Verse 10 through 15 talks about the hired hand. And this is another critical portion of scripture um, I, I really want you to um, reflect on in your own study time. You know, verse 12 talks about the hired hand. He's interested in wages, not sheep. In times of danger, he runs away because of what he is. That's what he is. That's what verse, verse 13 says. He abandoned the flock to predators. Verse 14 says, I know my sheep. And he has a deep mutual knowledge like father and son. And so 15 says, I lay down my life. And if we go back to verse 11, the fact of central importance here is that Jesus was ready to sacrifice for the sheep. And he did. It was not just talk. You know, some of us can talk a good game, but when it comes time to deliver, that's another story. The, the, you know, be careful of people who come in your congregation stirring up trouble because sometimes they're not interested in feeding the sheep they're more interested in fleecing the sheep moving on to verse 19 verses 17 through 19 christ would die for the people runs throughout this section of god john's gospel both the love and the plan of the father are involved as well as the authority that he gave to his son so christ obediently chose to die otherwise no one would have had the, the power to kill him really i think there's a message here about sacrifice and i think we must be willing to sacrifice both for jesus and for our fellow man and you know i hope we continue to listen to his voice and that we are willing to obey his command as we ride along the roadway of life we experience many things. You know, sometimes the road is smooth. Sometimes the road is flat. Sometimes it's straight. Like we drive along effortlessly, almost as if we're on the Palisades strip, you know, just cruising along, looking at the, the, the sky and the blue ocean. We look at a wonderful scenery and we take it all in and we're just grateful to be alive. Other times we find ourselves in places where the road is so bumpy. It, it is so crooked. It is so uphill. It is like driving down to Riverhead Camp. You know, we just want to stop, get out, and sometimes just, we want to quit. You know, I've been on journeys like those, and sometimes, you know what? I just turn around. I just quit. But when we talk with Jesus, our motto has to be no turning back no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. It's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be smooth, 
the scenery is not always going to be like Palisades. You know, sometimes it's going to be the traffic in downtown. But you still have to press on because home is calling. Jesus went all the way to Calvary in obedience. And he died for our sins. So we know that Jesus will always take care of us. So let me again remind us before I get to closing. That Jesus leads us. He gives us abundant life that he laid down his life for us. That like a good shepherd, Jesus knows, he sustains, and he protects his sheep. He even sacrificed himself for them. The sheep recognize the voice of, his, of their own shepherd and they respond only to him. The shepherd did not call the sheep randomly, but only those that belong to him. Jesus is calling you and he's calling me. And I pray God that we will not only hear his voice, but we will respond because of course the Lord is our shepherd and we will not want present nor in the future. And as Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of glory that will never fade away. And you know what? I hope you're in humility, preparing your head for that fitting of that crown with humility because Jesus does take care of us. So I want to close with the story of Fanny J. Crosby. You know, Fanny was blind shortly after birth and remained blind throughout her life. She never wrote, wrote down the lyrics she had created. As a matter of fact, she committed it all to memory. And until finish, it was never written down. Surely, she had some incredible experiences which led her to write a song with which we'll close. It says, and we can sing, you know, if we want, we can hum if we want. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. God told us, of his love for us in John 3 16. He sent his only son to die in our place while we were yet lost in our sins and turning our backs against him. If that wasn't love, then the oceans are dry. And those of us who follow him have given ourselves to him and are able to sing as Fanny Crosby penned, I am thine, O Lord. We must naturally want the next step to rise in the arms of faith to be closer drawn to him. But how does one rise in the arms of faith? Father Crosby said, draw me nearer, nearer blessed Lord to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer blessed Lord to thy precious bleeding side. I thank you for your attention. And I hope that you too are committed to draw nearer to Jesus because we know that Jesus will always take care of us. I thank Amen. you. Amen, Amen. brother. Amen. Amen.